I'm a PhD student in the Natural Language Processing Group at Stanford. My advisor is Chris Manning. I've been working on natural language processing, in particular using deep learning to do fairly high level natural language processing tasks like machine translation and text summarization. Yeah, well, I mean, Stanford is a really great place to work. There are so many computer science legends who started here, and, uh, you know, there's so many extremely smart people in the CS department, both the students and the faculty. Um, Let's see, I mean, I partially chose Stanford because the weather is beautiful and I'm from England, which is pretty cloudy. Uh, and it's really exciting to work here, actually. It's really exciting to work at a university, which is in the middle of Silicon Valley, because there are all these tech companies with these uh, amazing AI research labs, you know, like Google, and Facebook and so on, who are doing some really cool work as well. Uh, natural language processing is an area of AI and it involves understanding and processing and generating natural language. So natural language just refers to human language, for example, English or French or Chinese. Yeah, I think it's very important to have an appreciation for language, in particular a respect for the complexity of language if you want to try to work in NLP. And this is in fact sometimes an area of contention in the field right now, uh, because sometimes it's a meeting of two fields, right? There's linguists, and there's computer science scientists. And I think it is very important, yes, to understand and respect language if you're trying to solve it with computers, which is very, very difficult. Um, deep learning roughly corresponds to the use of neural networks. And neural networks are a particular type of um, AI model that consists of taking some kind of input, which is essentially just a vector of numbers, and then doing a lot of matrix multiplications and applying nonlinear functions, and then you get your output, which is also a vector. And the idea is that you have to learn the right weights, the right matrices to multiply by in the middle so that your neural network is computing the function you want it to learn. And the way we learn the right weights is to show it lots and lots of examples. So in traditional machine learning, typically the research scientists would design features. That is, you would take the input and the researcher would decide that uh, this list of features encapsulate the important things about the input, and then they would learn the correct function to compute on top of those features. Whereas the big idea in deep learning is that you learn this function end to end, the idea being that you just feed in the raw input, and then the neural network learns what to compute on top of that. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Why deep learning now? We all know that neural networks, uh, there was a lot of neural network research back in the 80s and the 90s, and a lot of the architectures and ideas that we're using now were invented back then. I think uh, there's a few reasons why it's happening now. Maybe we have access to more data than we did before, and that's necessary to get deep learning to work well. We have access to more computation than before. We have more powerful computers. Uh, those might be the two main things. So there have been some very notable achievements of deep learning NLP, the most obvious of which is probably neural machine translation, right? So Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they're all using neural machine translation to do their machine translation, and it's fairly successful. In fact, it's clearly a lot higher quality than the systems we were using before with more traditional machine learning. So, you know, that's a clear win. It does work a lot better. But you asked, what are we still unable to do? And I think there's still quite a lot of things that are not easily possible with uh, deep learning and NLP. So for example, uh, reasoning. So beyond just fairly shallow uh, pattern matching, if you actually want to reason about something uh, that involves kind of several steps of thought, that's still very difficult and you have no good way to do that. Uh, processing longer pieces of text and understanding them as a whole, anything beyond really a simple sentence, a single sentence, is quite difficult to do. Um, Incorporating background knowledge, so having knowledge about the world, like common sense, and then to apply that and understand how it fits into the example that the model is seeing, that's really difficult as well. Um, so there is two main ways to do automatic text summarization. Extract of summarization is when you're essentially selecting parts of the text to form the summary, whereas abstract of summarization is when you write the summary in your own words. So I suppose there has been there has been more research in the past on extract of summarization because it's essentially a lot easier to select text than to generate text 
and generating natural language is itself a hugely difficult thing to do. Uh, but with deep learning, I think there's been renewed optimism that perhaps abstractive summarization might be possible. So people are working on that quite a lot right now, but I think it remains extremely difficult. Sentiment analysis is a NLP task where you look at a piece of text and then you judge whether it's positive or negative in sentiment. And there's been a lot of work doing this in recent years using deep learning quite successfully. So you can get quite far, you can do quite well at sentiment analysis, essentially just using keywords, i.e. looking out for words that are typically either positive or negative. Uh, that can get you a fairly good accuracy. But of course, you're going to be confused by phrases like uh, not good, right? Because you need to understand that now the good doesn't mean positive because it was preceded by not. Um, but beyond that, you do need to understand something beyond keywords if you want to do sentiment analysis of more complex uh, sentences. So I think the issue you raised, the fact that as of now, deep learning is much more an empirical, um, an empirical practice than an analytical science. I think that is a big problem, but perhaps the thing that you said about how we're raising a generation of scientists who think empirically rather than analytically, perhaps isn't actually the main danger. I think the main danger of uh, neural network being, sorry, of deep learning being an empirical practice is that we are building systems that we don't really understand. I think that has wider dangers. Um, I think, yes, that's what I was alluding to, the fact that when you're developing these systems that are uninterpretable, then now there is less of a clear sense of accountability to even the model itself or the people who made it, because clearly you can have biases that creep in, for example, from the data, um, or maybe you don't know where they came from, and it's hard to detect them, it's hard to understand why they happened, and it's even hard to get rid of them once you know that they're there. So yes, I think it's pretty dangerous, but there's a lot of people who are working on the whole fairness and bias question, which is really important work. Currently, there aren't many ways to do that, though I have read a lot of different research work trying to work towards that. And there are a lot of different approaches that you can take, uh, none of which are going to give you a conclusive answer, but there are kind of analyses that you can do on the neural network to try to get some hints. So, um, for example, I actually just read a paper that essentially would look at how the neural network um, decided to come to a decision. It would look at each layer of the neural network and then for each of those layers, which are essentially vectors, uh, compare that vector to the corresponding layers for the examples in the training set. So this can help you see, oh, on this, level, on this layer, it was, it was similar to another one in the training set. And that can help you understand which examples the neural network thought it was similar to. And this can help you, for example, guard against uh, adversarial examples, which is when someone very subtly changes the input so that it gets misclassified. But if you can do this check on each layer, then you can um, get a confidence for how, how likely it is to be a real example. This was some work I read uh, from DeepMind. Yeah, I suppose when you, when you teach a machine to learn how to do a task, or try to teach a machine to learn how to do a task, and it manages to do it to some degree of success, then a frequent thing that we find is that the machine learned a strategy which is different to what we thought it would learn. And sometimes this can be annoying and difficult because you define some reward function, but the machine learns some counterintuitive way to solve the task, which isn't actually what you wanted. But sometimes it can be interesting because it is actually a good solution, but not one that we would have thought of, which is what I think happened in AlphaGo. And this can be useful, for example, to the expert Go players. Um, but I think it can also be useful, for example, to complement the skills that humans have. So you mentioned uh, teaching traders how to do new kinds of trading. Another example is uh, medical fields, for example. Um, there's a lot of work going into training machine learning models to aid doctors in, for example, noticing patterns and making diagnoses. And this can complement doctor skills because uh, doctors are only one human, they're only able to see so many cases in a lifetime, whereas a machine learning system can be trained on a huge amount of data and can see patterns in a way that a human simply can't. So I think there's great potential to complement the skills that humans have with the skills that machines have, namely uh, noticing patterns in huge amounts of data.
So um, earlier we talked about what deep learning can and can't do in NLP. And I think that itself is a question worth thinking about that isn't necessarily clear. So for example, we can do machine translation pretty well at the single sentence level. But does that mean that we're necessarily understanding everything about the sentence that we're translating? Or are we just really good at translating the small words and phrases and rearranging them and putting them in the right order? And I think there's evidence to suggest that perhaps we are not understanding it at a very deep level with neural networks. And it's actually operating on quite a shallow level. So there's sometimes a danger that we appear to be able to do a language understanding task quite well, but actually we're only understanding it very, very shallowly with the neural network. Yeah, I think that there is a tension between data and methodology, and usually the more data you have, the less you care about methodology, because to an extent, you can just throw more data at the neural network and that will help but it does stop at some point. Yes, it does plateau out. And we do definitely need better methodologies, better techniques in order to do the things which we're currently unable to do. For example, like reasoning, like incorporating a lot of knowledge. And all of those things are completely necessary to solve certain tasks. Yeah, I think a big challenge in deep learning as a whole right now, including in NLP, is that we work in these fairly separated tasks and we start from scratch for every task. And you can see that doesn't really make sense because you're having to learn language from scratch for every NLP task you want to do. So there are a lot of people who are working on building, for example, one model that can do many different tasks, which is called multitask learning. And I think there's a lot of progress on that. So it's, um, I think it's fairly likely that maybe we'll have some models which are more generalizable that know more about language in general and can do several things with it. However, I think we're still restricted to the kinds of language tasks that we can do with deep learning. And that is language tasks that are fairly shallow and don't require um, very rigorous understanding of the text or much reasoning or background knowledge. I think it's pretty important. Um, so, you know, I don't work in industry, so I don't tend to use these proprietary data sets. I tend to use these publicly available research data sets where at least everyone's using the same data. But I think I would imagine that if you're using different data to a different company, then that will completely change the kinds of results that you can get. So I would imagine in an industry setting, the data is pretty important. Secondly, the methodology um, is fairly well known, right? Because researchers are putting the methodology online very rapidly. So if you can find it, there's a lot of information online about the kind of methodologies that people are using.